was it a lie? Yes, I, I believe that to to be the case quite unequivocally, actually, which is not something I would have expected from Lindsay. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of personal respect uh, for Lindsay, and, and in fairness, he's actually been he's been very even handed with us up until the the last week or so, but. You know, he, he crossed a line and the reality is that not only did the Speaker of the House of Commons break the rules, he's now also broken his word. And the importance of his role in facilitating democracy in the House of Commons is, is huge and he's, he's obviously not up to that task anymore. A lot depends on how determined the SNP are to oust the Speaker, Lindsay Hall. How determined are you? I have been pretty clear on my views. Uh, I don't think I could be any clearer, if I'm honest. You know, last Thursday, some folk did suggest I might have jumped the gun a wee bit by by saying that uh, I'd lost confidence in, in the Speaker, but then his actions yesterday, uh, where he rode back on a, a promise that he'd made, not just to the SNP, but to Parliament as a whole, and therefore the, the public, um, proved my, my view to be correct. And I, I do think that Lindsay's position is untenable. He can't be in a position where he's being bullied into a corner by the Labour Party um, in the first instance, but to then make a promise to the Chamber and and break that promise is, is doubly bad. Um, did he lie when he made that promise? He just did to get through to the end of the day with no intention? Or do you, th do you think he's done this in bad faith or in good faith? Did, was it a lie? Yes. I, I believe that to, to be the case quite unequivocally, actually. Which is not something I would have expected from Lindsay. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of personal respect uh, for Lindsay, and, and in fairness, he's actually been he's been very even handed with us up until the the last week or so. But you know, he he crossed a line, and the reality is that not only did the Speaker of the House of Commons break the rules, he's now also broken his word. And the importance of his role in facilitating democracy in the House of Commons is, is huge and he's, he's obviously not up to that task anymore. So what, following on the next question then that Chris Mither was posing, what do you do now? Do you turn up to PMQs? Do you use future debates to call for him to go? Look, we'll, we'll assess all the, all the options as they, as they arise. I think a couple of things need to, to happen before then, though. I, I think that Parliament needs to properly investigate the circumstances around Sir Keir Starmer's meeting uh, behind the Speaker's chair last Wednesday. I think we all need to have a greater insight as to what's happened there because the sources who I'm aware uh, of were very close to two events have told me that Sir Keir Starmer met privately with Lindsay and all officials were, were kicked out of the room. Well, why was that necessary? And um, that's a significant breach of, of precedent in itself right before a decision has, has been taken. I, I think we then need parliamentarians to reflect upon the fact that the Speaker has, has in effect, lied to them. Um, not just to the SNP, but to, to all parliamentarians, because he made a clear statement last Thursday and, and walked away from that. That was it. Yeah. He said that there would be another opportunity to debate. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The issue. And, and, you know, we, we took that in good faith, um, which is why we put down the motion yesterday in order to, come on, to move the debate on, um, to have that discussion in relation to Gaza, with regards to arms sales and also with regards to making sure that the UK used its vote of the UN in terms of an, of an immediate ceasefire because that's been at the core of everything that we've been doing for, for months now. And Lindsay Hoyle denied us the opportunity to do that. So the first time it was in cahoots with Keir Starmer, second time was just, uh, I assume, to save his own skin. Um, but, you know, we, we'll, we'll be steadfast in, in our views on this because uh, we, we need to be clear about the fact that when we are speaking in Westminster, when we're voting in Westminster, we're doing so on behalf of the public who send us here. And there's an expectation from the people who send us here from, from Scotland that, that we stand up for them and their values and their views. But you've already, I mean, I've been watching what's been happening in the Commons, you're already testing the, rule, the other rules in Parliament. Some of your colleagues turning up not wearing ties, uh, clapping. The, the, what, what you're doing in the House of Commons is already testing his authority. Are we going to see more of that? <laughs> I mean, what a bizarre place eh, that someone gets themselves, uh, our speaker gets himself very excited about people clapping uh, and wearing a tie. But there are the rules, speaker. and you know what the rules are, and normally you abide by them. And since this has happened last week, you've been, you and your colleagues have also been quite clear, deliberately not abided by them. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure the public will be overly concerned about whether someone's got a tie on or not, or whether someone applauds or makes a, an odd sound from their mouth in order to support someone. But look, we'll. Are you we'll, going to wear a tie at PMQs tomorrow? Ah, uh, yeah, we'll do because my mum would not forgive me if I didn't wear a tie. I should say I was looking sloppy. Uh, so yeah, of course I will. Um, like I. What's the next plan then? You've got what seventy odd MPs have backed this motion, no confidence. It doesn't seem to be growing. So what is the plan? So the, the the ultimate 
outcome here will be determined by what the Conservative Party want to happen. Do they want a speaker in place who can be easily bullied by Sir Keir Starmer? Um, or do they want someone who's going to act with a, an even hand across all parties? Um, I, I think it benefits all of us to have someone who acts with a, a fair and even hand across all parties and who, who doesn't tell fibs from the chair. That, that should be a prerequisite of, uh, of the role of speaker. And uh, I'll just go back to it, Matt, if I can. You know, all of this is, is derived from the fact that the SNP has been unequivocal since the real scale of what Israel was doing in Gaza became apparent about the need for that immediate ceasefire. We've pushed at every opportunity at PMQs, at votes, to ensure that this was brought to the attention of, of Westminster and tried to influence the outcome of UK foreign policy. We managed to change Labour's position. They now back an immediate ceasefire. That's good news. Um, but we wanted to go further yesterday, and Lindsay Hoyle denied us the ability to have that vote. Isn't the truth, though, Stephen Flynn? You are a very adept politician. And what you were doing actually last week was try to put Keir Starmer in a difficult political position. That everyone knows what the SNP policy is on a ceasefire. Using your opposition day debate to, re to restate that, your motion was never going to be passed with whatever Labour did. And uh, it, even if it had passed, it doesn't become government policy. It is all about signals and politics. What, whatever happened in the Commons last week, if it, everything had gone your way, it wouldn't have made the blindest bit of difference to British foreign policy or what was happening in the Middle East. So the same people would have said the same thing to me, <coughs> pardon me, um, before November when we first brought a vote on, on the ceasefire. And in the four months or three and a bit months that had passed since then, we managed to get the Labour Party to completely change its position. If the House of Commons had... That's my point. This is about politics. You're not interested in no, changing no, the government's no, no, no. position. No, no, you're, no. you're trying to needle the Labour Party who are in danger of overtaking the SNP in Scotland. So, so what we were hoping to do was to garner more support for an immediate ceasefire. We managed to do that, which I'm delighted... So rather than bank that and say, great, the Labour Party now on board, why don't we all come together and vote for a motion that we can all agree on, you put things in, the, in your motion deliberately knowing the Labour Party couldn't support it because you were playing politics with the war. No, nah, Matt, like, I don't think anyone can accuse me of being... You did. Um, you had a motion and then you, you're, you just said yourself you got the Labour Party to agree with your original position, so then you came up with one you knew they wouldn't agree with. No, that's not the case. I've, I've called out the collective punishment of the Palestinian people for months since the sheer scale of what Israel was doing in response to the abhorrent attacks um, by Hamas on, on October 7th. Their response to it has been disproportionate. It is collective punishment, and I've been very clear about that. It's for Labour to talk about why they can't uh, or the, why they don't believe that withdrawing food, water, electricity, medicine, shooting and bombarding a civilian population isn't collective punishment. I believe that it is, and that's been, that's been my firm view for months, and I've been clear about that, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. The Labour Party put down an amendment which noted an immediate ceasefire, and I was very clear publicly on the day that I was happy to support that. We never actually had a vote. I, I left the Commons Chamber in disgust at what was happening to go and stand in a voting lobby to vote for Labour's amendment. That vote never happened, and, and I'm a little bit frustrated with that. But ultimately, I was more frustrated at the fact that we didn't have the opportunity to vote on what we'd put forward. We get three bites of the cherry a year. Yeah. The Labour Party gets 17, and you know the, the Speaker didn't deal with us in, a, in an even-handed way. He said he was worried about MP safety. Mm. He's been vindicating that, hasn't he? The, 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 you know, the stories about uh, MPs who've got bodyguards, police mm. cars. Like, there is a problem with MP safety, and what you did last week was actually make that problem worse. On the, on the contrary, I think sending out a signal that Parliament will change its rules and its processes because of threats is more dangerous um, than Parliament taking a stand on a on a foreign policy But issue. it was done because you were deliberately trying to put Labour MPs in a difficult position while there was a massive protest outside. No, I, it was done because I believe that there should be an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and I believe that the people of Palestine had been the victims of collective punishment. And yesterday what I sought to do was to end arms sales to Israel and to compel the UK government to vote at the United Nations for an immediate ceasefire. I was seeking to use the parliamentary processes to put forward the views of myself, my group, and importantly, the vast majority of the people of Scotland who, who agree with us. And indeed, I think people across the rest of these, these aisles. That's how Parliament works. You elect politicians who have values and they stick with them. I know what my values are. I've been very clear and consistent for months on them. It's for other people to explain why, why, they, don't, why they don't agree with what, what I'm saying. How long has Lindsay Hoyle got? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Um, I I struggle to see how Lindsay can continue after yesterday. But he just will, won't he? 
if your number, if the number's going up, if the number of people who sign that motion doesn't change, you just will just carry well, on. That's, that's, indeed, that's and that's up to the the Tories to, to decide what they want to do, whether they're going to make parliamentary time for us to have a debate and a vote. Look, what what Lindsay did yesterday was was extraordinary because he went back on a promise he'd made to to MPs, and I'm not aware of a speaker having done something so egregious. And as such, uh, I fully believe he needs to go. Who would you like to see a speaker instead? Oh, I can't be bothered. <laughs> I'm genuinely not bothered. Just someone who... A Tory? Do you think... I, no, I just prefer someone who who dealt with things in an even and fair way. Uh, in the way, in fairness, that Lindsay had done for a considerable okay. period of time where he walked away from. Stephen Finn, good to see you. Thanks so much for coming Cheers, in. Matt. SNP's Thank leader you. in Westminster, Stephen Flynn.